Huh? Seems to work. Okay. Is it too loud? No. Okay. All right. It is a pleasure to be back to GGI. Um, and um, last time I was here was 2015, lecturing about supersymmetry. So things have changed uh, quite a lot. Um, and yeah, so I, uh, last week I was here for part of the conference and I heard uh, many talks on um, normalizing flows. Or we all heard, or those of us who are here, heard uh, many talks on normalizing flows. Um, and um, so clearly it's a hot topic. And it's also something I've been uh, using in, in my work. So I thought given the um, extended time slot, um, it might be worthwhile to give sort of a more pedagogical introduction to normalizing flows. Because uh, like every talk we heard last week was sort of like five minutes on this is what a normalizing flow is and then here are my cool applications. Which is, you know, what, what you can do in, in a short, short time period. So yeah, so I, I thought I would take you through um, <clears throat> the sort of the basics about what normalizing flows are. And then whatever, and I'll do that on the blackboard. Um, and then whatever time uh, permits, I'll, I'll then talk about um, some of the applications that, that I've been working on. Um, okay, so feel free to ask me lots of questions and stop me, um, uh, interrupt me um, at, any, at any time. I'm happy to um, make this as, you know, as interactive um, as possible. Okay, so good. So yeah, so what are normalizing flows? Can you all see from the back? Okay, great. Um, so normalizing flows um, are, I would say, uh, a powerful new method uh, for density estimation and generative modeling. Okay, so that's the main, it can do the, these two things. So these are, I guess, uh, density estimation and generative modeling are some classic uh, machine learning tasks and I'd say some of the tasks which are uh, supercharged by sort of neural networks and modern techniques. Okay, so, um, so the goal of density estimation Um, the goal of density estimation is given some data D, like these data points here, let's say, okay? So given some data that we assume, I guess, yeah, that we assume are IID, so drawn from some distribution uh, independently um, and identically, then, uh, so given data, data D, what is the underlying Uh, P of X. Okay, so that's the, that's the goal of density estimation is to learn the underlying distribution uh, as best as possible uh, from, from, the, from some set of data. Okay, and we're all familiar with how to do this, say, in one dimension. What would we do in one dimension to do density estimation? Yes, thank you. So in one dimension, you just make a histogram, you'd bin it, um, and, uh, you know, the histogram is a density estimator, or you could try to, say, fit it to some function that you like, like a Gaussian or something. Uh, so both, both are, um, uh, you know, things that people do. Uh, and then the thing that makes this interesting or novel um, uh, is that normalizing flows allow us to do this in an unbinned way and in much higher dimensions, okay? So in the examples I'll show you, we're going to do uh, there's going to be like a five-dimensional example and there's going to be a 500-dimensional example. Okay, so that's the, and we're working on examples with, say, 50,000 dimensions. So, so there's, there's sort of a wide range of possibilities. Okay, so that's density estimation. Um, and a close relative of this, or a variant of this, is conditional density estimation, where the data might be come in pairs like this. Okay, so let's say that's, I mean, you can view it however you want, but let's say this is the, the data and the, these are the labels, let's say. Um, and then you wanna learn 
P of X condition on Y, let's say. So that's another thing that normalizing flows uh, enable us to do in high dimensions and without, without binning. Okay. Uh, and then finally, yeah, so the, so I said it's uh, normalizing flows are a tool for density estimation and generative modeling. So the other, so what is generative modeling? That's where uh, same data, but we, uh, our goal is not necessarily to learn a function P of X, you know, learn the value of the density probability density at every point, but it's to learn the probability density somehow, could be implicitly. Uh, so uh, draw, so learn to sample from P of X. Okay, so gen the goal of generative modeling is to learn the d density what somehow, could be explicitly or implicitly, but in a way that enables you to sample from the density to produce more examples that are of the same type uh, or follow the same distribution uh, as the data, okay? <clears throat> and yeah, I think that's also a key point uh, which I wanna emphasize is that, um, so some approaches We can do uh, P of X, but not samples, okay? And uh, some approaches uh, enable us to do the reverse. Okay, and you might say, well, how is it possible I could draw samples from the distribution and not know what, not be able to tell you numerically, you know, what it is? And this is actually what um, two other famous generative modeling frameworks uh, do. Okay, they learn the probability density um, implicitly. Okay, so it's, yeah. So they, they, learn, they learn it um, inside, but there's no way to get it from, from the GANs or the VAEs. Okay, good. So I would say one strength of normalizing flows, one reason why they're so powerful is that can, they can do both in principle. I mean, the in principle qualification, you'll see what I mean by that in a moment. I mean, they can do both. Uh, they can go in both directions, sampling and density estimation. It's that one might be slower than the other, but uh, in principle, they can, they can do both. Okay. So, yeah, so I'm not gonna be able to cover every aspect of normalizing flows in this like 45 minutes or so. Um, so like more advanced topics, you may have heard of last week from Arosh, like uh, trying to build in symmetries and things like that. I won't be able to cover things like that. Uh, there are, you, we also heard last week a little bit, maybe it was just mentioned in a talk that uh, there's a new, newer idea than normalizing flows out on the market called uh, score-based or diffusion models. Uh, which are doing state-of-the-art on uh, images. Um, so I won't be able to say much about that. So you can think of this as just covering the, the basics. Okay. And all of this, I'm not going to give, I think, hardly any references. Um, but if you want, I can you know, post them somewhere after the, the talk. It would just take me too long to write them all out. But all of this sort of started, I think, in 2015 and a series of key papers in 2017 and 2019. So it's all... Um, uh, relatively recent. Okay, any questions so far? No, okay. Uh, good, so what's the idea of a normalizing flow? It's to learn a, um, so it's to learn a transformation between the data, which will sometimes maybe refer to as the target space. Okay, we want to learn a transformation of this data to uh, a latent space. Well, yeah, we'll refer to the, the data distribution as a target distribution, and we'll refer to the latent space distribution as the uh, base distribution. Okay, you wanna learn, let's say a map, 
f of x equals z, uh, where f is um, invertible, um, more or less smooth. You'll see that you know, we can make it piecewise smooth. We can relax that somewhat, but basically differentiable. Um, invertible, and um, we'll see that we want a tractable. Am I writing too small? Or It's okay. Tractable uh, Jacobian. I want a tractable Jacobian. Um, I'll explain what that means in a moment. And of course, the most important thing is that we want it to map it to a latent space where z, the, the base distribution, follows uh, a simple uh, specified uh, distribution. So for example, the case that we'll be assuming for the most part here is that it follows the uh, unit normal distribution, okay? So, Let's say x, by the way, let's say x is uh, d-dimensional, okay? So given some d-dimensional data, uh, the normalizing flow aims to learn, so f is the thing that's being learned here, okay? It's the thing with the trainable weights. Uh, the normalizing flow aims to learn this map from the data space to the latent space such that it maps the complicated data distribution to just a simple distribution that we specify in advance, like the unit normal. Okay, and if, okay, so then F inverse exists, because this is invertible, bijective, all that stuff, so we can also go in the other direction, right? And um, so now let me explain how normalizing flows can, can do both density estimation uh, and sampling. Okay, so how do we do density estimation? So all we have to do is use the change of variables formula. So P of X, so P of X is a probability density. So it should be related, uh, sorry, to P of Z uh, DZ, right? And it should be related as a density is related, right? So we should be able to uh, you know, divide both sides by dx, basically, and read off what p of x is. So this is like the Gaussian that we specify in advance. You could pick something else, whatever you like, like a uniform distribution. Um, so that we specify in advance, we know what that is. And then this is the Jacobian, which, you know, z is this map uh, given by f, so this is just the Jacobian of the transformation. Looks like that. Okay, so the transformation F not only has to be invertible and differentiable so that this Jacobian exists, but it should be simple enough somehow that this Jacobian is calculable, is tractable, yeah? Um, and, you know, if, if we only had to evaluate the Jacobian once, Maybe um, we could get away with a lot more, but in order to train this thing, as I'll mention and uh, describe in more detail in a moment, we're gonna have to evaluate this Jacobian many times, you know, like every mini batch. So, um, so yeah, it has to be pretty fast to compute for this whole thing to be uh, feasible. Okay, so that's how we do density estimation. Yes, question. Oh, I'm overloading what I mean by P here. Sorry. So it's not the same P. Yeah, yeah. Sorry if that's confusing. I, I don't know what else to do. Yeah, yeah. This is one P, the P we want to know. This, unfortunately, I gave it the same name, but think of it as like Q or something. Yeah. This P is the Gaussian. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the Gaussian. So for example, Gaussian, and this is what we want. Yes. Do your results in practice depend on the choice of distribution that you make for this like simple latent based distribution or for any distribution that's reasonably simple, can you just train a normalizing flow? 
Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, what I'm presenting is like the idealized scenario. So in principle, it shouldn't matter what you choose. But uh, there are a few caveats. So in practice, yeah, it may matter. Like if you're, let's say your distribution is very multimodal and you just happen to pick a distribution that has the same number of modes, you know, then the machine may learn more easily. Okay. It may converge faster. Whereas if you pick a, the, wrong, the wrong distribution, it may never converge or something. Or, you know, yeah. So there's okay. all these nitty gritty details that I'm sure we all have encountered before. Um, yeah, yeah. Was there another question? No, okay. Good, so that's density estimation. That's going from the, the first direction, x to z. And then sampling, or generative modeling, is just going in the other direction. So density estimation is x to z. And sampling is just going z to x. And I don't really need to, so we draw from P of Z, and then we map our samples to X space, okay? And then we have samples that follow P of X. So that's, that requires very little explanation, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. And then let me also mention how we train these normalizing flows. So what's the loss function? So that's something I really like about this framework. Uh, if you've studied GANs, for example, the loss function is a balance, a non-convex balance between uh, the generator and the discriminator, right? It's a, it's a saddle point, uh, which makes the training inherently uh, unstable. Um, and, uh, and also it makes it hard to evaluate. There's no good single metric that is guaranteed to tell you what's the best model or what's the best epoch of your training to pick. Uh, for normalizing flows, uh, the situation is much nicer, I think, uh, because they give you the density estimate. Okay? Unlike GANs, the normalizing flows explicitly give you the density estimate, and so we can train the model with maximum likelihood, um, which is you know, generally the best thing you can do if you have access to it. So let me write down the loss function, and then you'll see what I mean. So the best loss function to do would just be the log likelihood, the log likelihood of all the data points conditioned on the model parameters, right? That's the, so maximum, like this is the maximum likelihood uh, estimation, right? We, we write down the probability density of the, we write down the likelihood of the data, so this is the likelihood of the data given the model log of the likelihood of the data given the model, right? It's just this. And here theta are the parameters of F, okay? So F is the thing we're learning. It, these are the parameters of, of the normalizing flow F. Okay, so it's that simple. Um, we just take the density estimate, um, uh, we just take the density estimate that the normalizing flow provides us, take the log of it, and evaluate it on all the data points. And we try to uh, maximize, yeah, sorry, so we want to put a minus sign here, so the negative log likelihood, uh, then the optimization objective is just that. Okay, we want to minimize the negative log likelihood with respect to all the parameters, with respect to all the parameters. Okay, and um, good, so, right, so, and yeah, this is a, so this is nice because, so this is nice because, of, you know, it's, MLE is generally, I'm not a statistician, Lewis is not here, I guess, so, yes. That's the question, but this loss is unbounded, right? It's unbounded, no, no, um, well, no, I, don't, I think it's convex, yeah, should be. Because the probability has to integrate to one, so I can't, I can't do anything I want. But it's 
could approximate a kind of delta function in the Ah, the, the delta function. Yeah, 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 yeah. makes it unbounded. Of course, it is bounded if you impose some regularization on your... Right, uh, right. So the normalizing flow... Right, it has some inductive bias built into it, I guess, that we're not quantifying here. But it can't... Uh, it, it's not arbitrarily expressive, so it won't, it won't just choose... In general, it doesn't just choose the, the delta functions if you have enough data. Um, it, it can't... It doesn't have enough parameters to just fit... Uh, delta functions. Yeah, but that is a concern. Like, and you would check that with usual uh, methods of splitting your data into a training set and a validation set. And if it was just delta functions, then you'd, you'd immediately see that in the validation set because now all the points are shifted and, um, and, and the delta functions would not give you a good, good loss. Yeah. Yeah. D did you have a question? Yeah, more or less was a similar thing. But uh, at the end, then this uh, training algorithm is very prone now to overlearning. Uh, so if you have something that is extremely flexible, uh, will drift uh, towards the empirical distribution. Uh. Towards the delta functions? Yes. Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, the fact that we force it to be um, invertible and smooth probably gives it some inductive bias so that it can't be. I mean, the, the, di this, the distribution we're forcing it to be in the latent space are, um, are the, just like Gaussians, right? So. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I guess, yeah, that's probably where the inductive bias is coming from. I guess the requirement of being smooth. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's it's, it's, it's very, way, yeah. yeah, the spiky del delta function thing is starting to look very not smooth. Although, yeah. it, so, yeah. uh, written like this is, is unbounded. So if you don't put a... Uh, you can drift towards uh, modifiers uh, instead of uh, delta functions. Uh, and uh, how... Uh, Narrow are the modifiers uh, depends on the how flexible is your neural network at the end. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Marat, you had a comment. It's not so much a question; it's a minor comment on the thing you said. I think on top that, on top of the inductive bias that you mentioned, like even in the overparameterized regime, I think you expect these things to behave semi reasonably because you still have the standard. The still the stochastic nature of the descent that you're doing acting as some sort of implicit regularizer as well. Yeah, it's possible the training of it with the stochastic gradient descent also helps to regularize it. Yeah, that's not something I'm, I'm an expert on. Yeah, good. Yeah, in practice, we don't observe these. In practice, I mean, yeah, as users of this method, I, I don't observe the delta function failure mode. So something is, something is happening under the hood uh, to regularize it, um, but yeah, yeah, that that could be a concern. Um, okay, I, I guess the statement is that for a fixed model capacity, this probably is convex and bounded. I mean, assuming the model doesn't have infinite capacity that lets you get to the delta functions, um, with some reg regularization, this becomes well behaved. Um, so yeah, so. Okay, so yeah, in, in practice we find the, the loss, you know, is, seems to be bounded and seems to be a good, um, provides a good uh, method for model selection. Okay, so picking the model based on the loss, this log likelihood, uh, negative log likelihood loss, seems to work well um, in practice. Whereas for the GANs, again, that's a big long-standing problem of how to pick the best model. And if you look at the GAN literature, it's actually, it's not very rigorous like we would like, um, or, or quantitative. They often pick it just by eye, like with a by eye test. They'll train it for 10,000 epochs, and I don't know how they look at 10,000 different generated images, but yeah, they'll pick, they'll pick the best epoch by eye. Um, yes? Hi. Uh, could you also compare it um, to variational autoencoders? Because there you don't have the problem of this unstable training. Yes. So some comments about VAEs or, or compare the performance. Yeah. Uh, compare. So, so what is the, uh, in the functionality, the difference? Uh, and then maybe in practical applications. So if you have used them also. 
Yeah, so in, at least in the applications that I've considered, the VAEs have never been as powerful as the flows. So that's just my experience. Um, and I guess, yeah, the VAEs, they don't allow you to access P of X itself. It's some variational bound on it. Um, so that introduces, uh, so maybe that regularizes things in a, in a nice way, but it also introduces some gap. You know, you'll never quite hit P of X then. Um, with the with the variational with the variational bound, and what do you mean that it didn't perform as well in your cases? Can you give an example? Um, yeah, I won't be able to present any explicit. It's just that on the density estimation task or the generative modeling task, they they did not produce as good samples uh, as as the flows. Yeah, we tried. So they, this quality of the the samples that they produced were worse by eye. You could see just making some histograms that they're not as good. Um, and in the, like we've done anomaly detection with them and then the power of detecting the anomaly is also not as, not as good. Yeah. That's not to say, you know, if we tried very hard to um, optimize hyperparameters of the VAEs that they would have uh, not have worked as well. But yeah, I'm just um, saying what we were able to achieve. Um, yeah. Okay, good. So, all right, so that's how we train the normalizing flows. And now let, me let, now let me describe the, um, how do I erase? Use this? Or this, is this? Ah, okay. Is this better? Mm, it's faster. Okay, uh, good, so, so now we just need to specify a family of functions um, for the flow. Okay, and it should satisfy those uh, conditions above. So, so family of functions, okay. Um, and so we want it to be, we want this family to be as expressive as possible while uh, maintaining those conditions, okay? And uh, so there's, I would say there's sort of two key ideas here. So key idea number one is that you can build F out of simpler uh, invertible maps. Okay, so if I have a sequence of invertible maps, then if I chain them together, it's still invertible. Okay, so I can build a more expressive F by composing a sequence of them. Okay, and, uh, and, and yeah, so then the determinant of the Jacobian of F is just the product of the determinant Jacobian of all these. Right, so if, if these have tractable Jacobians, then you know, as long as I'm not chaining together too many of them, uh, this, this should also have a tractable uh, Jacobian. Okay, and so this is where the idea of, but this is why we call these things a flow, okay, is that um, you're not going directly from the data space to the latent space in practice. You're gradually transforming the, the data you're gradually transforming the data, you know, through a series of latent spaces until finally uh, you reach the latent space you want. Okay, so that's that's the idea of the flow, or that's why we call it a flow. Okay. The other, I would say, the other key idea here is um, to focus on a special, so this is, this is the key insight, I think, or the key idea that allows for a tractable uh, Jacobian, okay? So, and that's to um, focus on a class of, sorry, auto-regressive transformations. So focus on a class of 
transformations that, yeah, question. Hi, I wanted to ask if this number of um, different class of uh, functions, this yeah. is a hyperparameter or? It is, absolutely. So you, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, Thanks. yeah. So, right, so, yeah, good. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, the last thing, the, the, the second key idea here is to focus on a class of transformations that's called autoregressive, and this is what allows the determinant to be tractable. And the, the, the transformations then are restricted, oh, sorry, I, well, uh, okay, it's not the same, um, hmm. maybe I should, well, okay, I should have called this thing something else. Um, all right, sorry, bad, bad form. Um, it's not the same F, F says above. Okay, it's a, I'm, I'm reusing this, this name. Um, okay, I hope that's not too confusing. Uh, so this is the, what an autoregressive, what I mean by autoregressive transformation. Okay, so if, so think of, okay, I, I probably should have stressed this earlier, but F is a vector-valued transformation, right? It maps a d-dimensional vector to a d-dimensional vector, right? So these are, think of these as the components of F. So F is vector-valued, so F1, F2, Fd, yeah? It's, sorry, it's not the same Fs as above. Okay, maybe I should call those Gs or something. Okay, everyone with me still? Yeah, so, so this is the structure in autoregressive transformation, and why does this make the Jacobian tractable? Well, you probably already see it um, in your head, but if I compute the Jacobian matrix, then it is zero in the upper, above the diagonal, right? So it's only non-zero uh, here, right? And so what's the determinant, uh, so, oh yeah, so the determinant, I, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but the determinant of a general, this is a D by D matrix, right? This is a D by D matrix. So the determinant of a general D by D matrix uh, turns out takes order D cubed operations. And so that's bad uh, in practice. Like if you want to do D is 500 or a million, so the, this cube, cube is, is bad, apparently, for computers. Okay, whereas this, this uh, upper triangular matrix, or uh, yeah, in general, an upper triangular matrix, what's the determinant of that? If you remember your linear algebra, it's just the product along the diagonals, right? So, so this, uh, the determinant of this is just, so this is gen generically, and in this case, it's the product of z i x i, i from one to d, so that's order d operations. Okay, so focusing on the autoregressive transformation class enables the, uh, these um, normalizing flows to be uh, tractably trained. That's what they found in practice. <clears throat> I mean, it's not just, I think that's like a practical thing. If, if someday computers could fit D cubed operations into memory or do them fast enough, then this would not be a consideration. But practically speaking, by, by making this assumption, current computers can, can train these things. Then. Okay. Is that bad? Okay. Um, Okay, what about invertibility? How do we ensure uh, invertibility? So that has to do with the family of functions that we pick to go here. Okay, so that restricts our choices for the components of F. Okay, and one way to think about uh, invertibility, one way to think about invertibility is to say that to think of Fn invertible 
as a 1D function of xn for every x1, xn minus 1. Does that make sense? So if I hold fixed the first n minus 1 coordinates and just think of it as a function of the nth one, I want it to be invertible with respect to that one, then, um, then I can have an invertible transformation. Is there a question? No, okay. So, so IE F inverse of Z1 is X1, oh, sorry, F1, holding fixed X1, F3, holding fixed X1 and X2. So then, you know, if it satisfies these conditions, then it's gonna be invertible. So in that sense, uh, what we're learning, sort of probabilistically, I would say, is what we're learning is P of X N conditioned on the previous ones. Right, so if I think of it as just a one dimensional function of the nth coordinate, transforming the nth coordinate conditioned on the previous ones, then I'm learning this one dimensional distribution conditioned on all the previous ones. That's what the nth uh, component of the transformation uh, does for me, okay? And so that's what, that's why, I think that's why this is called autoregressive, is because when I have this kind of structure, like I have D, a d-dimensional vector and I'm like a sequence and I'm learning the next one conditioned on all the previous ones in a sequence like that, that's, that's called autoregression, I think. Uh, and you notice that if I multiply together all these uh, conditional probabilities together, I will get the, the full um, joint distribution of all the Ds. So multiply, if I multiply them all together, I get the full joint distribution of all the, of all the Xs, okay? So this way of, of learning um, a generative model is also how you know, large language models work, right? They, they wanna predict the next word uh, in a sentence, right, or in a sequence. They wanna predict the next element of a sequence, and that's what they, that's what they do. Yes? I can hear you, I can hear you. Yeah. Ah, the, the zoom, the zoom. So my, my, my question is, uh, the reconstructed P of X will be then the product of all the F minus one, like it will be F zeta one multiplied by F zeta two. Like, what, what do you mean like if the yes. F minus one nth component is exactly the P of X N given all the, the reconstructed uh, F would be the product of all of them. Uh, right? Well, what I'm saying is that you can, think of, you can think of applying each transformation in a sequence if you want. Uh, and at every step, ah, okay. what you're doing is you're generating okay. from this okay. distribution. Okay. Yeah, okay. and so then if just by nature of sampling, let's say, in a sequence, sequentially, I am that is like the sampling equivalent of just multiplying all these probabilities okay, together. So, so to in get the practice, what, what, what will you do? Like in, in practice? Yeah, you will sample from zero, Z1, and then from that sample, that's like. Uh, in practice, practice, I think, no, well, I, maybe that's what it's doing under the hood. I mean, in practice, we can make this more efficient by, as you'll see, by putting them all into one big neural network. And then, yeah, if you really did it sequentially, I think it would be, D times slower. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, but we'll get to that maybe in a moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in, in practice, introducing this kind of causal ordering on the, on the, the X. That's right. I, I, is it a problem? Like in yes. practice? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. So this is not the most general thing you can do. So you could imagine this is a problem. Yeah. Okay. So in fact, um, what we do to counteract this, the best we can do is we will so this is like one step. So I said you can chain together simpler flows, okay? Yeah. And so this you could think of as one block, what I'm describing here, and I pick some ordering of the X's to start and some ordering of the Z's. Um, and then, so then, you know, I've, I've made some inductive bias that might not be great, 
And so what I can do in the next step is permute, permute the Zs, yeah, and I can keep permuting or shuffling or people do different tricks but it's, it's basically random at that point. Uh, and then, yeah, and then you can, by the time you get there, things are pretty well mixed up. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, Marat. Mm -hmm. so, getting a quick minor comment, right, that, the, that this is a problem in practice, but not a problem, just this, it's a problem in practice, but it's not a problem in principle, in the sense that any arbitrary distribution can be written as, is in an auto, as an autoregressive process. That's true, so yeah, this actually in some sense, I think this is the most general transformation, because I, yeah, I can always yeah. map any one-dimensional distribution to a Gaussian, let's say, and then yeah, I can, yeah. for a fixed, conditioned on that, I can try to do the next one, yeah, et cetera. The cost that you pay is that if you want to learn a completely arbitrary distribution, by the time you've gotten to the last variable, you need to learn this like incredibly conditioned distribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's you, this, this one, okay, that's a good way to say it. So this one is easy, and then by the time you get to the end, you've made it very hard, I think. And so that's the, so yeah, in an ideal sense, it shouldn't matter, but, but practically by the time you get to the end, the last one is going to be not as good as the first one. So then, then you try to shuffle things up uh, as you go along to hopefully expose each, hopefully expose more of the data to, to the easy step. Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay. So, um, good. So now let me tell you a few families of functions that have this invertible ability property. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, and then we can go to, I think that's all, then that will be sort of all I wanted to say. Um, okay. All right. Okay, so a popular, yes, please. I'm sorry, I'm still, I'm still a little bit confused. Like, does the, the, the autoregressive transform means that basically you could regress like F1 as a single valued function, like, and then the F, sorry, as a, a function from R to R, and then a fun, uh, F2 as a function from R2 to R, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what it really is, right? It, it's, um, it's this, yeah. So it's, it maps R2 to, yes. So each, so each of these are not invertible in and of themselves, right? Okay. So the, I said I wanted to think of them as invertible in that sense, like holding fixed uh, okay. all the coordinates but one, thinking of it as a function of just that last coordinate. So then it's a one-to-one -one mapping okay. as a chance and of being how do, how do you think these, um, let's say, uh, chain of functions, like the, the fact that the, the last one is very hard to, yeah. to regress, so how, how do, you fix this? do you fix this? I haven't quite... Oh, so, um, right, so, so you fix it by, I said in practice you fix it, you try to address it by um, chaining together many of these. So then the first step, you're not trying to get to the Gaussian directly. Okay. It, it can get to anything, really. Okay. Um, okay. And it, it's only the last step that you get to, to the Gaussian. So, so then after this step, you shuffle it uh, so that you expose the next one. So maybe, so now X, yeah. So now the last one got mapped to some complicated thing in this latent okay. space mm -hmm. that maybe wasn't perfect. But now you shuffle what you, after that step, you shuffle which one goes first so here. I, I shuffle the components basically. Yeah, you the shuffle vector. the Z, Z1 through ZD. Ah, okay, which doesn't change the determinant because of the properties. Okay, okay, I see. Also it doesn't change. I see, yeah. I yeah, see, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but Thanks. in some sense, uh, the problem is neither more complicated than the initial problem. Uh, because at the beginning, you have a very complicated problem uh, of a d-dimensional distribution uh, and find mm -hmm. the, the map between uh, this distribution and the, uh, the other one. Yeah. But then what you are solving before uh, is the problem of learning the marginal distribution first. Uh, so you are marginalizing over d minus one dimension and solving that problem that is easier. So you are just breaking out your problem. At the end, the last piece uh, will just be the conditional in d-dimension, uh, but it's just uh, the remaining piece uh, of the original problem that was already the dimensional one. So it's never more complicated than? It's never more complicated. Um, well, I think the last one probably suffers a bit, right? Because it's conditioned on the previous d minus one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it is uh, com more complicated than the previous ones, uh, but it's yeah. not more complicated than the initial one, uh, than the full problem itself. Than the full problem, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we hadn't done this autoaggressive thing, you're saying just try to go for it all, it would not be worse than what we're doing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair, I think. Good. 
Okay, so now let me, maybe I'll, things will be a little clearer if I give you an example. Okay, so a popular and effective uh, choice for F is pretty much the dumbest thing you could think of. Um, and that's the linear transformation. Okay, so we transform, you see how this has the structure that if I hold fix the previous ones, it's just a linear mapping, so it's invertible, no problem, uh, as long as this A coefficient is not zero, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so, so it's sort of simple in the nth coordinate and complicated in the n minus one. That's what we want. Um, that, that's the property uh, that sort of encapsulates what I was saying above there. And uh, so this, if, it's just a simple linear transformation, but sometimes people call it the affine uh, map in the literature. Um, and then, so then the, I guess another key idea here is that we can bring in the full power of modern, you know, machine learning by making AN and BN MLPs. Okay, so that's where the neural network lives in this story. Okay, so we, we we parametrize the coefficients here with, uh, say, fully connected neural networks. Okay. Um, and then it was a nice idea by um, the, some people called, they invented something called the masked autoregressive flows. And they also uh, masked, so this is called the math. So I'm giving you these keywords. I'm not gonna write down all the references, but you can Google these keywords to see the original paper. Mast auto encoder for density estimation. Um, they had a nice idea, which is rather than, this is what I was saying before, rather than compute these coefficients one at a time, why not just make them all into one, you know, one vector output of a neural network, no problem. Right? So neural networks handle vector outputs great. So we, we could start with the X's and we end with all the Z's, right? But we want to preserve this autoregressive structure. So we want, okay, actually not all the Z's. Let's say we end with all the A's, okay? A1 through AD. But we want the, you know, we want the A's here. Sorry if you, you can't see because of that thing. Uh, we want all the A's here to preserve this autoregressive property. And so what they realized is they could do that with a simple fully connected neural network multiplying by a binary mask, a mask, a preset mask of zeros and ones. So that the weights, let me just do an example of this with say three inputs and three outputs and one uh, hidden layer. So then normally I, for a fully connected network I would draw all connections here, right? But um, let me see if I can get this right. If I wanted to have the autoregressive property, then I do this. Oh no, I don't draw that one. <laughs> okay, wait, it's like this. It's like this. So this is um, x1, x2, x3, a1, a2, a3. Let me see if I did that right. So a1 is just a constant. It doesn't depend on, doesn't depend on the x's at all. Right? A2 can only depend on X1. So that's the only connection that's drawn there. Right? And A3, oh, I need to draw this connection. Okay. A3 can depend on X1 and X2. So these are the connections that are allowed. Right? And none of these A's depend on X3, because that's the last one. Okay, so people, the, the people who came up with these works, realize that they could speed everything up, again, get another factor of D by uh, making this all one neural network, one fully connected neural network, multiplied by a binary mask that sets some of these weights to zero. Okay, so that's the masking. Okay, so single MLP multiplied by a binary mask. 
Okay, the binary mask is just fixed from the outset based on you know, the dimension D and the hidden layers and all that. So they, pre they just pre-compute this, uh, store it somewhere, um, never have to think about it again. Yes, question. That's a lame question. Can you just repeat this dependency in your mask again? Can you go through it again? Yeah. Okay, okay. sure. I may have messed it up. It's always possible. So we want A1 to not depend on anything. A1 is just a constant, so that's why it doesn't have any weights coming to it. A2 should depend only on X1, so the only way to get back is like that. Uh, and then A3 should only depend on X1 and X2, so its weights take, take me back here, but don't, don't go to X3. And nothing should depend on X3. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, all right, so this also allows me to explain another key aspect of these. Uh, right, so this, this structure here that I've described that takes my inputs and spits out the A's, um, that's called a made block. Yes? One question. But then your map is not linear in the axis, uh, because at some point you might multiply x1 by xn in order to make it zn. Right, it's not, it's not linear, it's definitely not, we don't want it to be linear in all the x's, that would be bad. Okay. That would be not be very expressive. But it is linear in the nth, you okay. know, the zn is linear in xn, that's what allows it to be invertible. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now um, I can explain one other key thing about these made blocks or these mass autoregressive flows. Um, so I guess, yeah, I could say that a math is, so, so one of these things is called a made block, but a math uh, is the term that we'll use to describe a sequence of these. So finally ending in the Z. Okay, so, so the, each one of these is one of these masked, oh sorry, um, finally ending in the A's, let's say. Yeah, that's what actually, this actually outputs. So the made block, outputs the parameters of the transformation. And I, ch I can chain together ma as many of these made blocks as I want, that's a hyperparameter, uh, to produce uh, even more expressive uh, function parameterization of these uh, parameters. Okay, so that's, that's what we'll be calling the math, okay? And, um, and so yeah, let me just now explain finally one key thing about these maths, which is that they have a fast and a slow direction, okay? so. Let me do the inversion. So the inversion is like this over a n, okay? Um, and so I can write this also as the following. Le okay, let me specialize for the sake of argument to the case where I'm going directly to the Gaussian, okay? So then it's convenient to write it like this, okay? Because these are the mean and the width of, of a Gaussian, right? So, so P of X, if, if I were to do this all in one step, then P of X, oops, XN conditioned on XN minus one. This is just the normal distribution with mean mu N and uh, variance uh, sigma N minus one, uh, sigma N, right? And um, so, so what I'm describing here has a name actually, I don't know if you've encountered it before, but this is a simpler kind of uh, conditional density estimation. This is called a mixture density network. So if you like um, a single made block, if you were to do a math with a single step like this, it's really just a sequence of mixture density networks to do the autoregressive tra uh, transformation. Yes. Um, sorry, a uh, question. Like the uh, the made block M A D E is the one that you wrote, like the the, the multilayer perception one. Is, is am I correct? Yeah. Okay. So this is the why autoencoder. Why is it called autoencoder? Yeah. I don't know, that, I never understood that. So, okay. I mean, it, it maps something, yeah, I don't have a good reason. Okay, okay. Yeah. So you, you chain multiple multilayer perceptron 
and like each main block yeah. is the multilayer perception, I, I think, up to Xn. Am I right? Mm -hmm. OK, OK. OK, thank you. OK, so what I wanted to say here was, yeah, first of all, that there's, there's something simpler inside these things called the mixture density network. But also, if you look at this form, so this is the form I would need it in, to be in in order to sample, right? It's the inverse, right? So the inverse is the sampling. So I would draw from Zn, from a Gaussian, let's say, and then I would multiply by the width and, the, and shift by the mean to give me my sample, right? But notice what this would take in order to sample. So in that case, um, the people who did MADE and MATH realized that I could do everything with one forward pass of a single MLP, single neural network, right? But what does this take to sample? You see that um, these are functions of the Xs, not the Zs. And that is a key you know, issue here because um, it means that I have to evaluate this D times sequentially. Okay, let's say I start with the Zs, so I don't know what the Xs are, right? then I have no choice but to do this sequentially, right? So the first step, these are just constants, so I get x1. And then the next step, I know what x1 is, so I can plug it into here. Uh, sorry, x1, et cetera, right? So the sampling has to be done sequentially. So sampling, is sequential, and so it's an order d times slower than density estimation. So that's the price you pay for this uh, class of models, okay? Um, and, uh, right. So you can also define yeah, and this, this turns out to be a practical issue. Let's say for some applications that I'll hopefully have time to tell you about, if you want to do fast sampling, say, and D is 500 dimensional, then you don't want to have to pay a factor of 500 right off the bat. Um, that, you know, that could, that could kill the whole idea. Okay, so that led some people to invent what's called the inverse autoregressive flow which, I mean, it's a simple idea. You just start with the A's and the B's as functions of the Z's instead of the X's. Okay, so the IAF is the same exact idea, but you reverse, uh, you know, what goes in and what comes out. Okay, so, so that would seem to solve the problem uh, on the face of it, right? Now I can do fast sampling, but there's no free lunch. So IAF, so the math, uh, so density estimation is fast. Um, sampling is slow. IAF pays, has it in the other direction. Right, so density estimation is slow, and the sampling is fast. So, so this is a problem for training the IAFs. Okay, you can define them, and if you could train them somehow, they would be fast samplers. But training them with the log likelihood objective is slow, right? So let's say it takes me an hour to train a math, it would take me, so for 500 dimensional problem, let's say it would take me 500 hours to train the IAF, right? Because at every step, at every step I have to, in the training, I have to evaluate the log likelihood on the data uh, using the IAF, that's the slow direction. Okay. So um, when I talk about the first application, I'll show you one way that we came up with uh, to get around this problem that allowed us to train a fast um, IAF. Okay. So the, I've been talking, yeah, go ahead. Math and IAF, they are full flows. Uh, they're not just one, F, one F1, F2 or something like. Uh, That's the, right. Okay, so you're just taking uh, that function is all the way to the end from the good. 
Yes, yes, yeah. So, right, so the full, the full flow you would define is, you know, all the dimensions, these transformations, and then you would chain together many blocks to get even more expressivity. Um, that, that's what I'm talking about, yeah. But the points, all these points are still, still there, yeah. Good. So, okay, I've been talking for about an hour, so I think it'd be good to switch to the applications, maybe. Um, I, I did, so, okay, so I, I've been talking about these um, affine transformations the whole time, um, but there are, there are uh, var variations, sort of even more, there is an even more expressive class of transformations that people come up with, um, which let me just briefly mention because I'm going to need it for the application. Okay, so variations. So one uh, class of variations is called rational quadratic splines. Okay, sounds fancy. So what is a, what is a spline? I mean, a spline is just, you probably all played around with them before, but it's usually it's some, you have some points that you want to fit to, and you have some piecewise continuous uh, function that you fit through them. Yep. So the spline needs to be, in this case, we need it to be uh, monotonic. Uh, we need it to be piecewise uh, smooth. Um, if it's monotonic, I guess, yeah, it needs to be invertible. It's probably being monotonic guarantees that. Um, and yeah, at every, these are called the knots of the spline. At every knot, we need it to be continuous and, and first, first derivative continuous. Okay, so putting in all these constraints, um, uh, people found that you could parametrize rational quadratic splines um, in a tractable way. Okay, maybe I won't write out the formula, but the Instead of predicting the A's and the B's uh, from, from the X's, now you want to predict the locations of these knots and the values of their derivatives. Those become the parameters of the spline. Um, yeah, the locations of the knots, both in X and, y, X and Z. You, so a hyperparameter is how many knots there are, um, and then the, the location in X and Z, and the first derivatives. These become the things that the MLP uh, will predict. Okay, so MLP gives me the locations uh, of the knots and their derivatives. So that turns out to be, we found that this helps a lot in certain problems because it's much more uh, expressive than just a linear transformation. Okay? Um, and then there's another variation which is less expressive, which, um, maybe I'll just skip that for the interest of time, but let me just write it here and you can look it up. So we're gonna use RQSs in a moment, and there's another variation called coupling layers. Uh, and you can read more about that. These are less expressive than even the linear transformations because they're not fully autoregressive. See, those are not fully, I mean, they are a special case of autoregressive, but they don't do every uh, dimension in sequence. They skip over a bunch of them, and then, and then the other, it sort of divide the, the data into two parts, uh, the, 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 the feature vector into two parts, and conditions the one part on the other part. So it's a very special case of autoregressive. It's not the most general thing, uh, but it's equally fast uh, density estimation and sampling. So there's a trade-off here between expressivity uh, and, and speed. Okay. Um, let me pause to see if there are any questions because um, I want to move on to the uh, applications next. That was the pedagogical introduction to normalizing flows. Okay. 
I think there were already a lot of questions. People are probably eager to hear uh, about some applications now. Um, actually, before I do the slides, let me uh, just sketch out on the blackboard. Um, let me just sketch out on the blackboard uh, the applications I'm going to talk about. I'll try to limit it to half an hour, so I don't think I'll be able to get through everything. OK. So, so as the title says, uh, we've been applying these normalizing flows to uh, the LHC and, and to the Gaia data from the Gaia satellite. I'll assume everyone at least has some rough idea of what the LHC is, so I won't uh, tell you about that. Let me just mention briefly uh, some facts about Gaia. Uh, this is a satellite put up by ESA um, in 2013. And it's supposed to run to at least 2025. Okay, so it's already been running for, wow, time flies, nine years. Um, and it aims to produce the most uh, complete catalog ever of Milky Way stars. And the thing that makes it very novel, uh, I think, is that it's aiming to, so it's a satellite up in space and it's spinning around uh, to map out the whole sky. Um, and it can record the positions of the stars so precisely that it can actually measure um, how much they've moved in the course of like a year. And so based on that, it can work out what their uh, proper motions, as they're called. So their velocities, uh, their transverse velocities on the sky are. Okay, so the novel thing about Gaia is that it's in some sense going to map out the full it, it, it aims to map out the full phase space, so the 6D phase space, ideally, uh, of, of all the stars in the Milky Way. Okay. Um, and yeah, so currently it's on data release 3, uh, which consists of about 1.5 billion uh, stars, uh, which have, they don't have the full 6D phase space, these 1.5 billion stars, but they have the positions on the sky. These are the way we refer to those in astronomy, apparently. Um, so it's sort of like latitude and longitude on the sky. Um, the, what are called the proper motions on the sky. Okay, so the velocities on the sky and uh, some color information. Some, so they usually use this one to get the magnitude, the brightness of the star, and B minus R gets you the, the color of the star. Okay, so those are, of course, the telescope measures a whole bunch of other things, but these are the most important things, I think. It also measures and uh, parallax. So it, it gives you the parallax for all these 1.5 billion stars. Parallax then tells you how far away it is, okay? That's how you convert parallax to distance in astronomy, um, which is like, uh, five out of the six coordinates, right? And so now we know how far away it is. We just lack the radial velocity that would give us, give us the full phase space. Uh, however, the parallax for uh, the vast majority of these 1.5 billion stars are not, is not reliable. Um, they're too far away. Okay, so they'll give you the parallax, but it won't mean, the parallax error will be so large it won't be meaningful. So for a much smaller subset of stars, 33 million, you get the full 60, including like a good measurement of parallax and uh, radial velocities. Okay, so these are the ones, it's a smaller number because these are the closer stars. So it's about uh, within three kiloparsecs. So within three kiloparsecs of us, we have pretty good uh, 60, um, complete 60 information. Okay, so that's a very quick uh, overview of what Gaia is giving us. And, and this, yeah, hold on. So this gives us interesting applications to, uh, potentially to dark matter. So by measuring the motions of these stars, you could hope to uh, see how they respond to dark matter substructure uh, in our galaxy. 
and that could give us a unique astrophysical probe uh, into, into dark matter. So even if dark matter doesn't you know, interact with us, except gravitationally, data from Gaia, the dream at least, is that data from Gaia could tell us something about this dark matter um, just by virtue of its gravitational effects. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, how do you compute the radial velocity? They have a spectrometer. They have a spectrograph. So they, okay, they, so they take spectra and measure the, from the, redshift. the redshift. Yeah. Okay. And just, just in case, this three kiloparsecs means nothing to you. It, it meant nothing to me uh, until I started looking at this stuff. Uh, just a sense of scale. I think the Earth, the solar system is eight kiloparsecs from the center of the galaxy. But, so. but why can't you do that for all stars? It takes a long time. They have to sit there on the, on the line, to, on the SAR, for a long time to integrate enough to get a good spectral line. Okay, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. I think in astronomy, as I understand it at least, spectra take a long time, and just um, these kind of like photometric things uh, are fast. Yeah, that's the... Okay, good. Oh, right, so the, the brief, what I wanted to say is... Um, yes. What I wanted to say is, right, so, so my collaborators and I uh, have been working on applications of these normalizing flows to LHC and Gaia. I can make a nice little table here before I go to the slides. And these applications, I would say, fall into two classes. So sort of a traditional, I would say like a conventional application, what you would first think of doing with a normalizing flow. Um, at the LHC and at Gaia. Um, and then we've also been playing around or applying these to do sort of a, I don't know, a, another application of normalizing flows um, that maybe was, goes beyond what they were originally intended for, uh, which is using them for anomaly detection. Okay. So um, at the LHC, we've, we've, been using we've been using normalizing flows to do fast calorimeter shower generation. So this is surrogate modeling of Géant 4, okay, which is a big computational bottleneck uh, at the LHC. We're showing how we can do this much faster with normalizing flows. Um, and for the Gaia data, we, we showed, at least in a proof of concept, oops, um, that we could hope to measure the, directly measure the phase space density of all the 33 million stars in our neighborhood. Uh, and then from the Boltzmann equation, we showed how you could hope to get a direct measurement of the galactic mass density function, rho, rho of x. Um, so we, we've done this on a proof of concept study with toy, with simulated data where we already know the answer. We can compare to that. And now we're trying it out on the, the real data, um, which is fun and very annoying. Um, and we've also done another application, which is maybe only of interest to Gaia uh, aficionados, which is to upsample. We've used, we're, this is not out yet, but we're using normalizing flows to upsample uh, Gaia mock catalogs. So the mock that people produced mock catalogs for Gaia based on simulations, but um, the, best, the, the best simulations, which are n-body plus hydro, hydrodynamics with baryons, uh, they operate at the level of star particles, and each star particle stands for like 5,000 stars. There's 5,000 solar masses. So there's a step where you have to then upsample these star particles into actual stars if you're going to produce a mock uh, Gaia catalog. Okay, and um, yeah, so, so to produce a mock Gaia catalog and um, the, the techniques of normalizing flows turn out to be extremely suitable for, for doing this. Yeah, better than, much better than what they're doing now. I don't know if anyone has heard of something called NBID. No? Okay, it's something the astronomers came up with for density estimation. It's being recorded. Totally sucks. So yeah, so it's sort of very low hanging fruit. Okay. 
Then on the anomaly detection side, we've been using normalizing flows basically to learn the probability density of the data. And you could do that in sidebands, you can do that in signal region, or control region, signal region, and you can compare the two uh, and look for small deviations uh, in the signal region that would be the presence of, of an anomaly. And so we've developed some uh, strategies for that, which we've given uh, funny names to, anode and cathode, and then we've applied the same techniques. It's interesting to me, or I think I'm, I'm excited by the, you know, the cross talk between different areas, and we developed some methods for anomaly detection, or like enhanced bump hunting at the LHC, which we're then applying to Gaia data, uh, the same techniques um, to look for things in the Gaia data. We found that they're pretty good at finding um, stellar streams, uh, which I have t if I have time, I could tell you about. Okay, so that's just an overview of of various things that we've been applying. So there's one hammer, normalizing flows. Uh, I actually learned about them at a workshop at ICTP, Trieste, uh, in 2019, I think, um, 2018, and uh, didn't, didn't imagine at the time that it would have this many um, applications. So, okay, so if I have like, you know, a few minutes, I could tell you about, uh, show you some slides of the applications. Any questions? Okay, um, good. So let me just show you s some pictures of how Caloflow works. So I think at, at the conference, at least last week, for those of you who were here, you probably saw plots like this, showing how, uh, like this is the, oops, this is the uh, year after year computing uh, increase uh, total CPU hours or something uh, needed by the LHC, needed by CMS and uh, showing you how it's gonna grow. Um, uh, this is if there are no R&D improvements, and this is if you do Caloflow maybe, I don't know, just kidding. Um, so yeah, so with no R&D improvements, it will exceed the total you know, budget, uh, how much computing that, that exists, um, or is projected to exist uh, uh, at, at CMS. Um, and a big, big, big component of this computing budget is the need to have accurate simulations of the detector, okay? And a big part of accurately simulating the detector is, is simulating the propagation of energetic particles through the calorimeter, through a big block of material, okay? And, um, it's frozen? Oh, okay. Okay, good. So you could try to run Jayant 4 itself, and let's say you wanna produce 10 billion uh, showers, that would be very slow, uh, but accurate. And so the idea of surrogate modeling, this is a more general idea, is you wanna train, uh, you wanna produce a much smaller number. The, uh, producing the events are, um, is costly. So let's produce a much smaller number, say 100,000. Uh, and then we train a surrogate model, could be a GAN, a VAE normalizing flow. We train it on these smaller sample of events. We learn the underlying distribution, and then we can sample from that, which is fast, uh, to get the number of events we need. So that's the dream of, or that's the idea of surrogate modeling. And then if we can get a good fit to the um, training set, we would hope to get something which is both fast and accurate, okay? So uh, in these two works, um, my postdoc Claudius Krause and I um, uh, showed that you could get impressive performance gains uh, using normalizing flows over a previous state of the art, which were GANs, uh, in, in this task of modeling giant four calorimeter showers. So this is the um, sort of, I would say, yeah, the seminal work of uh, these people, which uh, first tried to do GANs for giant four calorimeter showers in 2017. Uh, this is a toy calorimeter that they came up with, which is based on Atlas eCal. And so we used their configuration and their training data so that we could compare directly uh, with them. Um, and so this toy calorimeter has three layers which have been voxelized uh, into 504 uh, voxels. And um, so that's the, that's the name of the game here. We, we want to learn, train a generative model on these showers and learn the probability density of these 504 voxel energies conditioned on the incident energy. And so yeah, so what we're doing is we're shooting a particle, simulated particle into this block of material uh, there's three types of particles being considered here, positrons, electrons, and pions. 
uh, and their energy, incident energy, is being uniformly sampled from 1 to 100 GeV. So this is an example of what one of these uh, electron showers looks like uh, in the three layers. And uh, so this is, oh gosh, it's probably too small for people to see, but anyway, um, this is the, these are the results we were able to obtain. Here's an average uh, E plus shower for us compared to Jeant. You see, it's, you basically can't tell the difference. And this is the GAN, which has many uh, artifacts here and definitely doesn't look like uh, Jeant. Um, so the performance versus the GAN overall is much improved. Here are some histograms of uh, some physics you know, features like the total energy deposited in each layer, the ratio of energies with respect to the incident energy, stuff like that. Uh, dashed here is the GAN and solid is our callow flow. So you can see there are several distributions where the GAN completely you know, barfed, but callow flow pretty much nails it. Um, yes? Which, te which technique is used actually in production in um, CMS? I, I think GAN is not used, right? They None of these are used. These are all yeah. proof of concept studies. Um, currently, CMS for production uses Jant. Um, yeah. So it's slow, but they're doing it. Um, the, the idea is that for like future, the needs are going to grow. And eventually, if they just continue doing what they're doing with absolutely no innovations at all, uh, they're, they're not going to catch up. They're not going to keep up with their, the amount of showers they need to generate. Yeah. So this was the example where um, you don't have training, you simulate every single event, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I was confused about this. Uh, you say you go from 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 5 and then simulate um, the other events or, yeah, or try so to produce. So, but then in high energy physics, there are very rare um, events, right, that you probably will miss by starting from such a small training example. Uh, that's, a that's a good point. Yeah. So if Okay, so yeah, here I should emphasize how these things are going to be used. So a given event has, has many such showers. An actual collision event produces, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of these showers. Each shower in general is not so high energy. So yes, there could be a tail event shower, a tail shower that we're not capturing here. But, you know, what we're doing is like we're averaging in some sense or summing all these showers up to get a picture of the whole event. So, you know, so it's not like each shower is itself an instance. We're, we're summing over many of them. So it's not necessary, you know, so, so it's, like, it's like we're fitting to a Gaussian, you know, and then and we're going to sample from that Gaussian many times, and then maybe we're going to compute the mean, the sample mean of that Gaussian from many instances, right? So then it's not as important to get the tail, right? Uh, I think that's a valid um, distinction, yeah. So yeah, so this, you might be concerned, you know, why, why is it valid to sort of oversample so aggressively? And it's for the same reason. So we're, we're at, for each event, we're actually generating thousands of these showers as IID things, and then we're summing them all up. So um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Okay, so yeah, so the performance against the GAN is much improved. We were very excited by this result. So we, by, by the way, we, we used a math with RQS transformations, which thanks to my pedagogical introduction, you know what that is now. Okay, so, um, so you can appreciate this uh, at a higher level. Um, okay, so we were very excited by this result, which is um, we, we trained a classifier to, to try to tell the difference between generated uh, showers and reference showers with the idea that if the generated model were perfect, and the classifier were perfect, then by Neyman Pearson, you would expect that um, the AUC of this classifier should be exactly 0.5. Um, and so, you know, caveats are our classifier is, cannot be fully optimal, okay? Um, so these are uh, just meant to be maybe uh, lower bounds, no, no, um, upper, uh, no, lower bounds on the AUC, like a stronger classifier might get a higher AUC. But what you can see here is that for the, at least comparing two different generative models, the same binary classifier we trained found that the GAN generated showers are 100% separable from Jeant, but the um, flow generated ones are not. There's some, there's some overlap at least. Uh, so, and as far as we know, this was the first ever um, generative model, certainly in our field and possibly we weren't really able to find any examples. This is not really something they do in the, say, image generation um, 
literature. Anyways, the first example we were able to find of a generative model pa passing this uh, classifier test um, in, in like a non-trivial way. Okay, and the kicker for these uh, maths is that they're slow, as we said. So here's a comparison of the timing. So just focus, say, on the last row here, where Jean needs about two seconds, or 1,700 milliseconds per shower. Uh, and the flow with the math, which is slow, uh, takes 36 uh, milliseconds. Sorry, there's no units here. These are, mil oh yeah, mil milliseconds. So 36 milliseconds, which is still faster than Jan 4, but uh, much slower, in fact, a factor of exact, almost exactly 500 times slower uh, than the GAN. Okay, so our maths, uh, our, our Calo flow is accurate, but not fast. Okay, and that's exactly the issue that we talked about here. Um, Okay, so then we wrote another paper, which we call CalFlow 2, where we implemented uh, inverse autoregressive flow, still with RQS transformations, rational quadratic splines. As, we, as I noted, the IEF cannot be trained with the maximum likelihood, the, the log P loss. So instead, we developed uh, a new uh, teacher-student method to train it. So we took the trained math and said that's the teacher, and it generates samples, um, or sorry, it, it does density estimation on samples, um, and we want to now fit the student, which is the IAF. The IAF should be the exact inverse of the, of the teacher math. Uh, and so we developed a loss um, that basically pe that incentivizes or forces the IAF to be as close as possible the exact inverse um, to, to the teacher math. Okay. And it looks complicated, but really it's, it's simple. You start with a data point, you map it through the teacher math, which is fast to the latent space, and then you map it back through the student IAF back to the data space. So this is always fast. And then you can also start in the latent space, map it to the data space, and come back. And this is also always fast. Uh, and so the basic component to the loss is to require that you get back the same data point, exact same data point that you started with, and also in the latent space. And so you can put in some more terms to help, help it become the inverse. Um, and we found this worked very well. Uh, and so that's the results we obtained with the, with the student. The AUC again passes the classifier test and the timing is now on par uh, with the GAN, less than 0.1 uh, milliseconds per shower. So yeah, so, that's, um, so there was a little bit of uh, machine learning um, innovation here too. Uh, besides just applying something off the shelf uh, uh, to this problem. Yeah. Was the unnormalized normalized difference, and why is it different in accuracy? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, was the normalized unnormalized difference, and why do you get a different distinguishability? Good, good, yeah. So these are all indications that we don't, probably don't have the optimal classifier, because the optimal class, so normalized unnormalized is how we, uh, process, pre-process the inputs before, so the input to these classifiers are the generated showers or the reference showers, so some image basically. And whether we, uh, we can just choose to feed that in in GEV units or we could choose to normalize them, so I think that's where we normalize each layer to unit intensity. So we actually take out the energy information and then we, fe we do feed that energy information separately to the uh, classifier. So it still sees all the information in principle. But, you know, if it was a optimal classifier, then these numbers should be identical because any kind of change of coordinates like that should factor out of the likelihood ratio. But, so the, the fact that these numbers are slightly different, you know, means that we were not fully optimal, but, so we just want to present both uh, cases uh, to give people a more clear picture. Yeah. Mm hmm Okay. So that's CaloFlow, and if you're interested in this sort of stuff, um, let me just advertise that we're running an open uh, challenge for fast calorimeter simulation, which, where we've produced three uh, open data sets. Uh, and the easy one is basically analogous to this Calogan data set that I was telling you about, has also about 500 voxels. And the nice thing about this is that this is the official Atlas uh, calorimeter simulation uh, training set that they used for their fast simulation development. So you can train your favorite generative model on an official Atlas data set that's public, 
Um, and if you perform better than their published FAST simulation, you know, they'll be very interested in that, right? So, uh, and then we've also produced two higher dimensionality data sets, the medium and the hard one, which have factors of 10 more uh, voxels. Um, and like one, one challenge that, you know, I'm working on right now is that if you just take callow flow, which, uh, you know, works well at this level and try to, up, try to do it at this level, it doesn't fit into computer memory anymore. So callow flow out of the box uh, doesn't work for thousands or tens of thousands of voxels. So we have to do uh, more clever things than just uh, what we've tried already. Okay. Um, I'm just going to stop when we run out of time. So maybe I'll just talk about one more thing. Um, to lunch? Okay. Okay. Uh, I would not want to keep people from their lunch, so yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point to bring up. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know, so I haven't followed the flows for images because they're not like state of the art uh, very much. My impression is also that, you know, if you just, so what we're doing here is in some sense, so the mass autoregressive flow with RQS, I didn't say it, but to my knowledge, this is the most expressive, so the most number of parameters basically flow that you can come up with or that I've seen. Okay. So, and it works well at 500 dimensions. Now, a natural image is a megapixel, right? So like a million dimensional. So this super expressive thing will not, does not scale to that. So if you could somehow fit that into a future computer, maybe it would do well for natural images. But, you know, I don't. So what they do for natural images, as far as I know, are much simpler, like these coupling layers, uh, which are much less expressive, uh, but are much more lightweight and can scale to a megapixel. So just at the level of expressivity, I'm not sure that the, the flows are, are hitting it, you know? But yeah, these other issues that you raise could also be part of the story. I know a lot of papers are written about that, but I'm not sure any of them are correct, you know? So, um, but I think it's an important distinction. So GANs for natural images seem to produce very sharp images and individual examples that can fool people, right? That's what GANs do. But there's no promise that GANs capture the distribution well. Whereas I think flows, there's this other trade-off. So maybe each individual example is not as sharp somehow, but in some sense we don't care about that for calorimeter showers because they all look, they don't look human interpretable anyway. What we care about really are distributions. And so I think flows capture, probably capture distributions uh, better than, than GANs do. Yeah, I think, are you referring to the studies that people do, for instance, this is all more like anomaly detection, where they'll train it on, train a flow on MNIST, and then they'll feed it this other database of images, like fashion MNIST, and they'll find that it has a higher likelihood than the MNIST images it was trained on? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what to make of those. I mean, probably in that case, the likelihood that the flow learned is not sharp enough. Yeah, like the, the MNIST data it was trained on is probably super, super sharp in the space of all images. So it, it wasn't able to like localize itself to that. Um, it's basically like the MNIST is like a delta function over here and fashion MNIST is like a delta function over here, but it, it learned something like that somehhow. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as far as our studies indicate, they do, yeah. Like, I didn't say, but we picked the model epoch based on the lowest log likelihood, and we've checked that if we didn't do that, we got a worse result. So for us, it correlates well, at least, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, 
It's on, I think. Perfect. I just want to go back to one thing that you just said. Sure. Um, that for images, you know, we want a sharp image because then, like, we, we will see the difference, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, and then you said that for the showers, we don't want it because it's anyway, like, not human interpretable. So if it's on average okay, then, then we're happy. But I, actually, I want to I wanna have a comment on that because now, as you know very well, I mean, with all the machine learning techniques, we're trying to go into more low level, you know, machine learning, right? I mean, we just feed, you know, individual candidates, you know, particle flow candidates are really like individual particles. And then I would argue that actually we want to have as precise simulation and we want to have all of these details because that's, I mean, we see that, for example, for jet tagging, this information is actually very important than to to separate, you know, to classify the jets. So can, can you maybe comment on that? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I don't have too much insight to add to that other than, I mean, I guess, yeah, I would hope that if the, your generative model produces nice looking distributions, say 1D histograms, 2D, you know, as, mu as, as much distributions as you could hope to, to make, that this would also lead to a pretty good emulation for a jet tagger. At least that's how we think about it in physics, right? So I guess, yeah, maybe there's just like less going on in one of these uh, showers than there is in a natural image in some sense. So yeah, so maybe there isn't, yeah, maybe this trade-off between like sharpness uh, and, um, and distributions is a fake trade-off. I mean, if, if you really hit the distribution perfectly, your images would also be perfect, so. But I think we have to be careful about this because then, like, yeah. I mean, we, we should also try to model all of the tails exactly for this reason. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this is, this is all going to be used for fast simulation, which is always, you know, something you do, uh, I guess, for the LHC, they're going to do this as a preliminary step, and then they would presumably do the slow but accurate method as well. Um, so yeah, so there are going to be, just like in current FASTM, there are limitations to what you can use it for. Presumably, there will for sure be limitations to what you could use any of this stuff for if it ever gets off the ground. And then hopefully the limitations are slightly go beyond what you can do now with FASTM, but I don't think you would claim to be able to do everything with this stuff. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks for the comments. Um, good, so let me just tell you briefly about anomaly detection. Um, so here is uh, one way to use uh, density estimation and, and sampling. So one way to use normalizing flows for anomaly detection. So uh, last week we heard a bunch of talks about uh, anomaly detection, model independent searches. So, so, so this is uh, another, talk, another mini talk about that. But uh, let me start with something you all know, which is a classic uh, semi-model agnostic search, which is the good old one-dimensional bump hunt. And here it's only semi-model agnostic because we make one assumption about the signal that it's localized in some feature, usually the invariant mass, uh, while the background is assumed to be smooth. Okay, but apart from these assumptions, then anything in principle uh, could be possible. Um, and so we, we, we can do a bump hunt by interpolating, fitting the data in the sidebands and then interpolating it into the signal region, uh, which is usually a window in the invariant mass, and then you search for an excess. Okay, so of course that's how we discover the Higgs, that's how we discover the Z. Uh, we know this method works. Okay, and a question many of us have been exploring um, in the past few years is whether you could enhance the bump hunt by including more features into the story. So what, how can I do a multi-dimensional uh, bump hunt? And in particular, you know, if the signal happens to be localized in additional features, how do we find that know where that signal is localized in a model independent way. You might say, okay, I could just scan over all possible places the signal could be. So do a multi-dimensional bump hunt, literally. But you would impose, incur quite a large trials factor, you know, if the, you have the curse of dimensionality to deal with. Okay, so the claim is that um, a general optimal uh, strategy would be if you could learn the uh, likelihood ratio between the data uh, and the background. If you knew what the background was uh, and you could learn this likelihood ratio, this would be something which we're, we've taken to calling the idealized anomaly detector. Uh, and the, the 
you know, the, the claim is that this idealized anomaly detector could be sensitive to any signal, uh, no matter what it is. Okay, so I don't have time to go through all those details, but suffice to say, what, what we're looking for here is basically like an overdensity, actually in principle an underdensity, um, but let, let's just say like an overdensity in this multidimensional uh, data space relative to, to the background expectation. Okay, so um, if we had access to this overdensity anomaly score, we could hope to cut on it and then greatly enhance the significance of the signal over the background. So cutting on this is like a model agnostic way of localizing where the signal is in this higher dimensional space. So here's a picture of how you could hope to do this. You start with a small anomaly in this uh, background, uh, MJJ, invariant mass, and as I cut harder and harder on this learned anomaly score, uh, I grow the size of my bump. Okay, so yeah, so we, we found, um, so this was the first uh, approach proposed by uh, these people um, to, do the, to do something like this, and they, uh, they showed how you could hope to do this with just a simple classifier. So, you know, this likelihood ratio that we're trying to learn between data and background uh, could be learned by a binary classifier between data and background, okay? And so where do we get the background from? Well, if we're doing this bump hunt, you could say the sidebands give me my background and the signal region give me my data. So all I have to do is learn, the idea then is all I have to do is learn a classifier between the signal region data and the sideband data, and I get my anomaly score. Uh, that, of course, assumes that the data in the sidebands has the same properties, the same distribution as the data in the signal region, at least for the background. Okay, in that case, so this is the idea of uh, classification without labels, uh, and in that case, we get a pretty good, we can learn this uh, uh, anomaly score pretty well. Okay, so something which uh, Ben Nachman and I proposed in uh, 2020 was to, as an alternative to this, was to instead train normalizing flows on the signal region data and the sideband data conditionally on the mass parameter. So then we learn these two likelihoods directly and we could hope then to take the ratio of them uh, directly. Uh, and there's this nice thing we realized which is that if you learn a conditional density estimator just in the sideband as a function of M, the bump variable, then it automatically interpolates into the signal region. That is, it never saw the data in the signal region, it never saw those values of M, but because these neural networks have nice, smooth properties, uh, it interpolates well into the signal region. So it's like this multidimensional bump hunt idea uh, of interpolating. Okay, so then if we have these two likelihood ratios, we can uh, produce the uh, likely, sorry, if we have these two likelihoods uh, explicitly, we could just take their ratio directly and, and learn this anomaly score, construct this anomaly score directly. Um, and so, you know, if, if the background data here is different than the background data here, then this method is, is better than the koala method. Okay. Um, and the last thing it came out um, last September um, where we realized that the same math that we had trained on the sideband could also be used to sample from. It doesn't matter that it's slow, there aren't that many features here, and we only have to do it once. Okay, we don't have to do it, uh, we don't have to do it many times, we're not going for speed. So we can sample from the trained density estimator that we trained in the sidebands and produce events that follow the background distribution. So, and that turns out to be nice because um, then we can learn a data versus background classifier like in Koala. So, so this combines the best of anode uh, and Koala, so we call this uh, classifying anomalies through the outer density estimation. Um, and this turns out actually to be, um, so we tried this out on some toy data with some toy anomalies thrown in, and um, this turns out to be the best, this cathode method turns out to be the best performing method by far, and in fact almost saturates the performance of the idealized thing where we know the background perfectly because we, we simulated it. Okay, so, so that's the summary plot showing you how much the significance so the significance of the bump is signal over square root background, nominally. So this is how much we can improve the significance by cutting on our anomaly score. We can show that you can improve it by up to a factor of 15 relative to where you started. And where we started was um, something which was roughly two sigma. 
So if they just did the inclusive bump hunt, they would only see a two sigma excess, and they would miss this anomaly that's hiding there. And if they run actually really any of these methods, they would see an excess that's way above discovery threshold. Uh, so that's an example of how they could be missing something uh, in the data uh, right now. So, um, okay, so I, I think I'm really out of time and I've been talking for a long time. So, yes. Do you have a feeling why cathode outperforms anode? Yeah, um, I do. So, right, so we explained this in the paper that, um, so, so cathode here is only sampling from the outer background, the, the, so it's only sampling from the background distribution, basically. Um, it, it, so it's only one density estimator, whereas anode is two. Density estimation is harder than classification. So, so you, you think that it's simply because it's actually a very hard task and when mm -hmm. you have to do it twice in the end, you don't do it as well as one time. <laughs> Well, plus the, the harder of the two is to do the signal region density estimation because there it has to learn the right. smooth background plus a tiny little blip, which is the signal. Right, exactly. That is yeah. always the hardest part. That's exactly. the harder one. Yeah, right. and so the classifier can learn that more easily than the density estimator. Yeah, at least for, it's, it's uh, less, less uh, takes less effort on hyperparameter tuning, let's say, to get the classifier to learn this uh, than, than the density estimator. This little and, blip. And then yeah. all of these studies that you show, there are no systematics of any kind, right? Well, uh, first of all, um, this, is, this is just the uh, significance improvement. So this, th yeah, so these methods are purely data-driven, okay? So at this level, there shouldn't be any systematics. The place where uh, systematics should enter is when you try to set a limit on the signal. Uh, also, when you actually try to do a proper fit to the, to the bump, you know, to the MJJ distribution. So we didn't do any of that here, yeah. So we just said, suppose my fit was perfect, and let me just, so I know how much uh, background I expect to get in the signal region, and I know how much signal I expect to get. So assuming, so that's assuming a perfect fit with no systematics. Now if you have to do a fit, you have to like propagate the uncertainties on the fit parameters into the signal region, that's a big source of systematics. Yeah, so that we did not include. Right, but but you still estimate your background, for example, in, in, the, in the cathode, right? You still estimate your background from a neural network, right? No, 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 yeah, that's the important thing here. This is, to make this plot, I just assume perfect background estimation. T to actually estimate backgrounds using this, you would not use cathode itself. You would use a bump, the bump hunt. Okay. Does that make sense? Well, we can talk about it offline, yeah. maybe, yeah. Okay, I mean, I, I think I should stop. I, I didn't get to talk about the Gaia stuff, but uh, yeah, I think I'm out of time, yeah. Okay, if you want to flesh through the last... Uh, yeah, well, okay, so, so yeah, we, we tried to do this first, or we're working on doing this for stellar streams. Stellar streams are these long, uh, elongated uh, tracks of stars in the Milky Way. They come from um, globular clusters and dwarf galaxies that are slowly, tidally stripped as they orbit the galaxy. And the hope is that they could be unique probes of dark matter substructure. Like if you have this stream of stars and then a clump of dark matter passes through it, it could rip a hole, it could rip a hole uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the stream like that. Also, if the star, uh, dark matter is self-interacting, it could produce qualitatively different looking uh, streams than if the dark matter were purely CDM. So, um, so yeah, so we realized that you could look for streams using uh, bump hunt methods because the streams are localized in position space, proper motion space, and photometric space. And so we actually applied um, anode, um, so we applied anode to uh, look for stellar streams. And uh, we first, in, a published, in our published paper, we showed how you could find one of the most prominent uh, and well-studied stellar streams it's called GD1. Um, so this one is very easy to find, but we showed how you could do it with our method. Um, so, so sorry, so this is an example where you, this is the, what you start with, all the data in a patch of the sky. After you train anode on it and cut on the anomaly score, this is, these are the stars that you're left with. And so this is the GD1 stream that you see pop out. Uh, so the method works really well uh, to find GD1 and then we, are working on applying this to the entire sky. 
So we had to download all this Gaia data, which is cool because anybody can download this data. Um, and it, you know, it's not too big, maybe like two terabytes. Uh, so we divided up the sky into 200 um, patches and uh, overlapping circular patches. And in each patch, we train anode on signal regions consisting of proper motion. Um, and this is a lot of computation. So we had to run this on um, a supercomputer cluster at LBNL that we applied time for. Um, and okay, so then we learn a bunch of things, uh, put it all together, sorry. And um, we also quantify the false positive rate using simulations that don't have any streams in them. So we got a false positive rate of 13% uh, that we estimate. And which is not great, I guess, but it's, it's not horrible either. Uh, so we show how you can rediscover a bunch of known streams. So these are all previously discovered streams by other groups uh, that we rediscover using our method. Um, and then here's a sort of a catalog of about 50 to 60 new streams that we think might be in the sky. So the black are all the previously discovered streams that are all plotted together. Uh, and the colorful ones are the new ones that we think we might be adding to the, to the catalog of all the streams in the Milky Way. So yeah, so that's a, that's a result we're working on publishing right now. It's, it's a lot to, uh, to get out in one paper but we're trying to put it out. Um, and yeah, so that's, uh, that, I think I should really stop there. Yeah, okay.